when we go through the season of Advent, the, the four Sundays prior to Christmas, we touch on different, different aspects of what Jesus means to us. Today we're going to talk about, talk about peace. In a minute we're going to read from John chapter 14, starting at verse 15. God is a God of, of shalom. Shalom. That's the Hebrew word for peace. It, uh, it's a major concept for, for uh, the Jewish people. Even to this day, when they greet one another, they, they customarily say shalom. Shalom. We, we say hello, they say shalom. And, and it doesn't just mean that people aren't fighting, that there's an absence of war. Shalom means that everything is working together like it's supposed to. It's, it's, a, it's a big concept. When God created all things at the very beginning, everything was working together like it was supposed to. There's, there's a way that things are supposed to work, and, and we know what that is somehow inside of us because we were created with that. Everything flourishing, somebody put it this way, everything flourishing not at the expense of the other, but all because of the other. That's what shalom is. When, when we, like for example as a church, when we as a body, when we're all using our gifts, when we're all building each other up, and when we're all growing together, and the way things are supposed to be, that's shalom. That's shalom. Peace is mentioned in every New Testament book except one. When the beginning of all of the letters in the New Testament, it says, grace and peace to you, usually. Peace. God is a God of shalom and peace, but we live in a world that is disturbed, that is not at peace. Things are not working the way they're supposed to. There's a fallen disorder that is come upon this creation, that's because, of course, we sinned. We turned against God, we disobeyed God, and ever since then, things have been in disarray. There's still some order that we can see, but there's a disorder that has come upon everything. It's it's a curse, really. When you open the door to sin, it just floods the whole place, and that's what happened. So, you don't have to look too far to see this. There was one day this week, usually when I get up in the morning, I have the Today Show going and while I'm just getting ready and stuff. And, and there was one day this week where it was just one thing after another that it was like, man, this, this world is in disorder. There was, there was the fires in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There was the California mom that was kidnapped. There were deadly tornadoes. And then there was uh, the Ohio State University car and knife attack. This one story right after the other that just highlights how we got, we got problems. Things are not working like they're supposed to. We can be very disturbed just by watching the news, can't we? Isn't it fascinating how we're even attracted like moths to a light by the disorder that's going on But the biggest thing is we live in a world that kills the Son of God. The Son of God came to us in Jesus Christ, which we celebrate in this Christmas season. He came here to teach us. He healed us. He even raised the dead. What did we do? We killed him in the worst possible way. That's the world that we live in. Just before Jesus was about to die on the cross, in fact, the night before, he said this. And let's look at our passage now. John 14. Starting at verse 15. Jesus had a a long discourse before he went to the cross, before he was betrayed and arrested. John 14, starting at 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I'm going to read verse 27 again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. We just said in our liturgy a moment ago, He Himself is our peace. Christ is God's Christmas gift of peace. It's Christmas time and we give each other gifts. Do we just give each other gifts for, for fun? We give each other gifts, or at least I hope we do, because Jesus Christ is God's gift to us. And when we give each other gifts, that reminds us that Jesus is God's gift to us and that he is the greatest of gifts. And one of the gifts that God gives to us in Jesus Christ is peace. Peace. Peace is a deep need within each one of us. And we seek it from a lot of different sources besides Jesus. You notice that he says, I do not give to you as the world gives, because the world tries to offer us peace too. They're kind of competitive, competitive sorts of peace here. We look for peace from lots of things outside of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of religions out there where their whole focus of what they want to try to offer you is inner peace. All of the, all of the Eastern religions, inner peace is a major component of that. That's it's what we're looking for. It's a deep need of our soul. There's a reason why people are attracted to that. In fact, uh, there's one quote from, from Buddha who said, Peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. That's, that's the alternative peace that's out there. For the record, inner peace comes from being forgiven of our sins and knowing that in our heart and finding the grace to move on from it. That's what inner peace is from. But we look for peace in other things, too, besides other religions. Michael Jordan, famous basketball player, maybe a little old for some of us here. But he said this, The game of basketball has been everything to me, my place of refuge, place I've always gone where I needed comfort and peace. We look for peace even in basketball, in, in sports, or in anything that we're good at. He was amazing at basketball. We find our peace in that, or we look for it there. 
but maybe none of us are as great at basketball as Michael Jordan, but we look for peace in other things. We, we like hefty savings accounts, for example, so that we don't have to worry about bills, because worry, that disturbs us. And so we want to soothe that by having a hefty savings account so we don't have to worry about those things. Money brings peace, or so we think. Friends and family, we, we, like to, we don't like to be islands, usually. We, we, like, to, we like to belong to, to a group of friends or, or a family of one kind or another. And, and to, try to, to try to fit in, we'll, we'll focus on you know, the right clothes, the right food, the right image, saying the right things. Because we think others' approval gives us peace. And so other people's opinions of us become so important. Or safety. We have anxiety about sickness and injury and death. And so we'll, we'll focus on safety because then we don't have to worry about that as much. And so we'll, we'll put locks on our doors and bars on windows and seat belts and car seats and insurances and, and that sort of thing because those things maybe will bring us some peace. Or sometimes we'll, we'll seek relaxation. You know, we'll, we'll seek out those, those sunny beaches and, and we'll, we'll buy scented candles. I love those, by the way. And beautiful landscapes, pleasing music, just anything that soothes us because we're, we're under stress. And so if we can relax, then maybe we'll be at peace. When this was written in Jesus' day. He was in the Roman Empire. And at that time, Rome was in a period of peace. They called it the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. In Jesus' day, peace was something that Caesar brought to the world. Okay? Caesar was the ruler of Rome. And he was considered the benefactor of Rome. Almost like the God of Rome, if you will. And when Jesus was born, some of you know this, he's mentioned once in Luke, it was Caesar Augustus. When he came to power, all of the civil wars of Rome stopped. He was an excellent administrator, a great ruler, and when he came to power, everything was at peace. And people loved him. They, they worshipped him pretty much. They considered him almost divine. And so peace was something that the emperor gave you. But Jesus says here, peace I leave with you. I'm the one who gives you peace. And I don't give to you like the world gives it to you. I'm not just talking about an absence of civil war here. I'm giving you a whole different kind of peace. So for us, knowing Jesus is peace. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have real peace. And Christ is our gift of peace from God. That's what we celebrate on Christmas. That we can have peace. In the midst of the turmoil of life and the anxieties and the worries, we can have peace. In verse 27 here, peace is mentioned twice. In, in Greek, there's only, there, it's mentioned twice in four words. Peace, peace. So emphasizing that there. Let's look at the screen and let's uh, answer the question together. We'll come back to that point in a minute. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance, our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. 
So this is who Jesus is to us. This is how he brings us peace. It says here that he's our chief prophet and teacher. As our chief prophet and teacher, Jesus tells us everything that we need to know for eternity. In, in life, when we go through it, there's a lot of things where what we don't know will hurt us. So, but in the case of God, Jesus has revealed to us everything that we need to know. If we, there's a lot of things that we don't know out there, and, and when we don't know something, that, that bites us in the butt, doesn't it? There was one time when, when my parents, they had a, they had a, a, a little crank well installed, um, and what happened was there was a, a mouse that had got into that somehow and died, and it was contaminating the whole, the whole stream of water that they had. So my mom, she was, she was drinking water and wasn't feeling very well, and so she would drink some more. Because, you know, you know, at the very least, water would help you feel better. She didn't know that it was the water that was actually contaminated and making her feel sick. What we don't know can hurt us. With Jesus, we don't have to worry about not knowing something. Because he's revealed to us everything that we need to know about God. Everything. There's a lot of religions out there that will say, well, there's, there's, there's Jesus, but then there's something else too. There's this other book. There's this other revelation that, that adds to it. No. Jesus has revealed to us everything that we need to know. There's not Jesus and something else. If you know Jesus, if you yourself know Jesus, then you know God himself. You're not missing out on anything. God is, is infinite, isn't he? He's, he's beyond us. We can't comprehend him. He's, he's all-powerful. We, we can't even understand that. He's beyond space and time. What does that mean? He, he's, he's bigger than what we can understand. God, by definition is unknowable unless he comes to us in ways that we can understand. That's what Jesus is. Without Jesus Christ, God is unknowable by definition. He's infinite and we can't understand that. In Jesus, we can understand God and we can know him personally. That's amazing. When we know Jesus, it actually says here, we know all things in verse 26. It doesn't even qualify that. Isn't that interesting? If you know Jesus, you know all things. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So, the counselor, this Holy Spirit, is going to remind you of everything that I've said to you, and you're going to know all things. All things. Wow. It says it a couple other times in the New Testament, too. First John 2, As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. His anointing teaches you about all things. It's pretty incredible. Now, I don't think all things here means car engines and quantum physics because obviously the Bible doesn't tell us about that. But it is safe to say that we know all the things that we need to know for eternity. We know it. It's right here. All of the important things Jesus reveals to us. As our only high priest, Jesus opens the door to God's house and family. Okay? We, we have this desire to belong, 
to people. We, we identify with, with certain groups. We know schools, for example. So, so some of us are Michigan fans, some of us are Michigan State fans, and even if we have no connection to that school at all, we identify with that group of people because that gives us something to be excited about, something to root for, and so we, we watch their sports and we root for their teams and we'll say, we won because we need to identify with a group of people. I'm not saying that's wrong, but this is how we operate, isn't it? Jesus as our priest, he goes before us to God and he makes us God's family. We can belong to God's family. So we think that if we just had some good relationships, we'd have peace. Jesus gives us a relationship with God himself. All the people around us, they're going to let us down because even the best of us, you know, we have our limitations. We can't be all things to all people all the time. But God can. God's family is our family. That's where we belong. And that's why here at church, we need to be able to belong to one another. We need to have God's love for one another. And we need to be encouraging and building each other up and helping each other. This should be, this should be the best place to be. When you're with God's people, this should be the best place to belong to. That's what we need to aspire, aspire towards. As our eternal king, he leads us and protects us. Jesus came and was born in a lowly manger, nothing really much to speak of. Kind of an embarrassment for somebody as high as he was. But he is our eternal king and he leads and protects us. And so we might be pressed, but we are not crushed. We might be persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We might be worried, but we don't need to worry. Because Jesus is ruler of all things. And as our king, he leads us in his best paths. Maybe not the easiest ones. In fact, certainly not the easiest ones. That's not God's criteria. He wants the best for us, not the easiest for us. When we're, when we're young and, and uh, we're growing up and there's mom and dad there, they don't always make things easy for us. That's not, what, that's not what they're there for, is it? They want what's best for us. And so sometimes that's going to be the hard thing, the thing that's not what we want. And we don't really get that. But, but we do trust that they at least have some of our best interests in mind, even if we don't like it. Jesus means confidence and hope in an eternal future. Usually when we think of our lives, we think about till the moment we take our last breath. No. No. It goes a lot, a lot farther than that. This is one blip on, the, on the, the whole scheme of things here. Just this moment. So is Christ the source of your peace today? This is what he offers. This is what he can be to us. Do you get your peace from him? If Christ is our source of peace, then we will have peace overflow in our lives. We will be people of peace, and we will spread that peace to other people. If we seek our peace from Christ, then, for example, only one opinion counts. We're not going to be worried about what everybody else thinks of us all the time. And we're not going to be dominated by that. We're going to do what God wants us to do. We're going to be faithful to him. And we're going to be thoughtful of other people and considerate of them, but we're not going to be dominated by other people's opinions. 
if we seek our peace from Christ, then other people can't control us. We can't be manipulated either. When Jesus is our peace, we can be ourselves. He gives us the freedom to be that. And he gives us the freedom to do what's right no matter what other people think or say. That's pretty powerful. So the bullying and the intimidation that we might face, it's annoying, but it doesn't work. And sometimes seeking God's approval means others will disapprove. And that's okay. We can handle that. If we have God's approval, we don't have to be consumed by what other people think about us. If Jesus is our peace, then the future might concern us, but we won't worry about it because we trust the Savior who holds it. We might be concerned about where things are going in our lives, in the lives of our kids or family or nation or world or whatever. We might be concerned about that, sure. There's some things that look kind of bleak and we don't really like the directions. That's understandable. But we'll still be able to sleep at night. We might be concerned about things, but we are not going to lose sleep over it. Because we know that in the end, Jesus is king and he's got it. We don't have to worry about it. We can trust him. Psalm 3 says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Even if we had tens of thousands of people against us wanting our heads on a platter, we still wouldn't need to be afraid because Jesus is our king. That's what this is saying. And for the person who wrote this, that was David, he did have tons of people who wanted him dead. And he says, you know what? Even though I have tons of people after me and want my life, I can still sleep in peace because the Lord sustains me. That's peace. That's what God offers. The peace of Christ means we can take sensible precautions, of course, but we refuse to fear danger. We're not going to be paralyzed by what might happen. Jesus preached this peace that we just read just before he went to the cross. And he was comforting them because he was full of peace and they were worried. They weren't going to go to a cross. He was. And he was saying, hey, I'm, I'm, it's okay. Don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. That's peace. If you're about to go die on a cross and you're saying, hey, I give you peace. That's what Christ can offer us. Jesus' peace means that we don't have to worry. The peace of Jesus shows when we can calm the fears of others even. When we can comfort and console other people, people who are in distress because of things that are going on in their lives. Whether that's being sick or losing a loved one or having a big decision to make, different things that are stressing them, trouble at work. When we can console other people, even if we ourselves are stressed, then we can be confident. We have the peace of Christ. Jesus was facing death and unimaginable suffering. He could still calm the fears of his disciples. So this Christmas season, let's not leave this gift that is Jesus Christ unopened. God has given us this gift of peace. Open that gift. Don't just let it sit there wrapped and say, oh, it's nice to have. Open it up. And you can have peace. Peace that will overflow into your life and that you can share with other people. Open God's gift of peace. 
He is the greatest gift. He's the answer to all the needs of our souls, including peace. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God in heaven, you've blessed us in ways that we have left unwrapped under the tree. And Lord, as you have given us your son, Jesus Christ, we pray that we would not leave him unwrapped in our hearts, but that, Lord, we would take hold of him and all that he is, all of the blessings that go with him. Help us to know that peace that he offers. Help us to know him so that we can know you. And Lord, please comfort us with him, our only comfort in life and death always. And we pray in Jesus' name alone. Amen.